Hi, Pamela. Long distance. <laughs> Pamela's right around the corner, so she could probably hear Carol yelling. Even. <laughs> <laughs> well, appreciate folks joining us. Uh, again, it's uh, uh, being recorded. Just put that on there. So if anybody's new and you don't want to be seen with your significant other, uh, you know, uh, now chance to virtualize them out of there. Uh, wanted to talk about the Chicago 1933 World's Fair uh, today. And... Uh, let me just uh, pull up here, share background, one second. Share screen, okay. Okay, so. Um, there we go. Yeah. Okay, we see it, good. It was yeah, interesting, good. I had not known anything at all about the Chicago 33 World's Fair, and I kind of got into it accidentally. Uh, as folks probably know, I'm a big collector of the 64 World's Fair. And on eBay one day, somebody advertised a roll of uh, negatives taken at the 64 World's Fair Belgian Village. So I happily bought them, and I got it and uh, scanned them. And I looked at it and said, this just doesn't look right. I'm, I'm looking at it, and if you look over to the left-hand side, the ladies' hats, and, and the dress lanes and everything, it didn't look quite what I remembered of the Belgian Village. But, you know, the, the bridge was there and everything. But then I looked a little closer at the bridge. And if you notice, it's kind of an angular bridge. And the one for the uh, 64 World's Fair was, was not. So hang on a second. Why is this not advancing? One second here. Okay, why are we not? Oh, I see what I did. One second. I, I, that's on Photoshop. And I needed to be, because uh, I had just changed that to a different uh, background. So one second here. So, okay, do we see it now? Same picture. But now do we see a color picture? No. Nope. Okay. Hang on. Let me stop screen sharing for a second. And I have to go and change what I was screen. Again, thank God I don't do this for a living, huh? All right. Now do we see a color picture? Okay. Great. So I looked at it and said, hey, this the bridge at the 64 World's Fair, it was a, a curving bridge. It wasn't angular. So I realized the Belgian village I was looking at in black and white was not the Belgian village from the 64 World's Fair. So I started looking into it, and it turned out it was the Belgian village from a totally different World's Fair, the 1933-34 Chicago World's Fair. Of course, that meant I now needed to go on a total mania craze and learn everything I could about it. So uh, go through the, uh, the fair and uh, discuss it. And uh, again, if anybody has any big burning questions during the middle of this, please let me know. If I make any giant mistake, please let me know. But the Chicago World's Fair is actually the second one that was held in Chicago. The first one was uh, the World Columbian Exposition, and it was a huge success. And it was basically one of the World's Fairs that people were measuring the success of World's Fairs by at that time. So they were coming up to the 100th anniversary of the Chicago World's, uh, of the founding of Chicago, and the thought was, hey, let's have another World's Fair. So in the 1920s, about 1927, they got a charter from the Bureau of International Expositions to have what at that time had the very imaginative name of the second Chicago World's Fair. Well, they started working on it, and one of the things they had to do was decide where they were going to put this thing. And if you've been to the other talks, you notice that almost every World's Fair begins with the thing, we've got a rundown, neglected rail yard, what do we do with it? Hey, let's get rid of it by having a World's Fair. Well, in the 1920s, Chicago did not have any neglected rail yards. Uh, matter of fact, at that time, the railroads were very, very big business in, in, Cal in Chicago. So they were not going to tear any of those out. And they did not want to go back to the piece of land they'd used for the Columbian Exposition because most of it had been repurposed. So they did something totally different was they created the land for the fair by doing a massive landfill along the shore of the lake and building the World's Fair on top of landfill. So this gave them not only the chance of a World's Fair, but it gave them a chance to have a whole new set of parks that were run along the side of the, uh, the, the, um, uh, the lake. This lady here, I will, had been a, a statue that was done for the previous fair. And basically it was the um, idea that Chicago is endurant. Uh, it can come back from fires. It can come back from anything. And uh, whatever Chicago wants to do, it will. So they started using this as one of the theme uh, elements for the design of the fair. Uh, what was interesting, though, is the fair, a lot of people in po the political circles did not want the fair to be. 
They said, we're going to get stuck with it. It's going to cost a ton of money. Uh, these things were always a boondoggle. As I've mentioned on other talks, almost every World's Fair loses money. And the city did not want to get stuck with it. So the city politicians said, no, we're not going to do it. Well, the bankers who were looking to bring business into Chicago and the uh, civic people that wanted to put their city on the map were trying to figure out what to do about it. So they actually hit on a very unique idea. Why don't we go to the public and start trying to get some money out of them? So they started selling shares in the Chicago World's Fair for $5. Uh, for your $5, you got a ticket book that would give you 10 tickets, to, uh, 10 entries into the World's Fair, assuming the thing had ever been built. And they started selling these shares. And I, I have to pull up the number right here. They sold 118,773 shares of this at $5 a piece. And $5 in the late 1920s, early 1930s was a significant amount of money if you think about the depression and everything else. But that showed how many people in Chicago were uh, very good memories of the last fair and now wanted to do something for another one. So they got the money. Uh, they also, the businessmen started saying, hey, we've got all these companies to do a lot of business in Chicago. If you give us money for the World's Fair to help us build it, we will make sure you get prime location for your business. So they started going and pre-selling spaces and plots in it and eventually got the money. Then, of course, all the politicians said, oh, well, World's Fair sounds like a great idea, right? Somebody else has already paid for it. We can take all the credit for it. So we're going to take a, a tour through it. As you can see, it's, it was along Lake Michigan. Almost all of it was reclaimed land, particularly everything you see on the left side where it says North Lagoon, South Lagoon. All this is uh, basically done with landfill. And we're going to start on the far left-hand side, and we're going to work our way up along the fair and uh, end up at the right side, and then we'll come back again. So this was basically going into the fair. You had Chicago off to the side, and you had uh, the park stretching out. Uh, over to the left was a temporary train station. You can see the ramps going up in it, so you could take your train, get delivered right to the fair. Uh, you also had a bandstand that's uh, sitting across it. But you also had, uh, this was the primary area if somebody was gonna drop you off at your car and they decided that they needed to have a lot of large parking lots because the car became a big way for people to get to the fair. The train was great if you were coming from uh, say New York to go to the fair, but if you were anywhere else locally, it was a lot cheaper and easier to bring the family there by car. So when you came into the fair, you uh, walked down the Avenue of Flags Somebody asked me just today what the flags, uh, if there were any particular color. They had all sorts of discussions. Do they do the flags of the nations? Do they do the flags of the states? They were back and forth about it. And one of the big concerns was, what if a lot of people didn't participate and you didn't have a flag for them, what did you do? So they finally just went with colored banners going down there. By the way, the fact almost everything today is going to be in black and white and we're talking about colored banners. It's one thing I wanted to mention was that the fair being in 33 and 34 is often referred to as the last black and white fair because Kodachrome was introduced basically in 35. There were some experimental different color films you could use beforehand, but almost every color picture you see of the 33, 34 World's Fair, particularly in things like postcards or booklets, was done through hand tinting. They weren't actual color photos. So this was supposedly a very colorful uh, thoroughfare of flags. For folks that have been to the Windy City, you know what happens to anything like a flag. They periodically shred. So they ended up having to spend a lot more money than they thought on flags to put along there because as one critic said, uh, you don't want to go in and see the avenue of flagpoles. You want to see the avenue of flags. Sears was a big, big player. It's, it's so sad, isn't it, today when you see all the Sears stores shutting and everything going down, it's hard to remember how big a uh, uh, America phenomena they were. But Sears was one of the first big sponsors of the fair, and they had a building here that had the, as you came in, you see the avenue flags off to the left, but as you got to the Sears pavilion, there was a, a very nice restaurant inside, but there was also uh, the fair's first aid was in there, a uh, major thing for uh, if you wanted and you needed information, not only in the fair, but for lodging in the area. So Sears provided basically a giant hospitality welcoming suite for everybody to come in. You could also, coincidentally, look through the Sears catalog, place an order at the fair, and by the time you got home to New York or uh, California, it would be there waiting for you. So they, they did not miss a bit, a bit on that one. 
The state of Illinois, being the home state for it, had several different pavilions. Uh, this was a, a very large one that had a lot of exhibits on the state uh, government, how it operated, state businesses. We'll see more of Illinois as we go on. This, uh, oh, I'll go back here one second. You see this tower ride uh, going across. We'll look at that more in a second. And the reason that came to be was because they had this design for a theme structure for the fair. Every fair has to have some theme structure, the Eiffel Tower, the Unisphere, um, you know, the Atomium, something like that. And this was gonna be the one for Chicago. Huge tower of water and light, uh, with giant fountains going and inside halls that you could walk through. And it turned out to be way too expensive. If you look at the size this thing was supposed to be given by this, you know, the people on the ground and everything, it was gonna be massive. So in 1932, the plans were underway. I mean, the fair again is gonna open in 33. In 1932, they decide we can't build this. It's just technologically beyond what we are capable of doing today with the budget that we have today. So no theme structure for this fair. So they went back to a plan that had been submitted earlier that had been rejected because nobody had ever built one of these things. And the guy that was proposing to do this had zero experience or expertise in it. He just thought this would be a really great idea to build these Skyway Towers. So in desperation to come up with a theme type element for it, they turned to it and they built these, these structures. They reached about, I think it was 230 feet in the air, uh, just massive, massive things. And you had these cars that went uh, across uh, on them. This is up at the top of one of the towers. This is one of my favorite pictures of the, uh, I've collected of the thousands of them from World's Fairs. The guy's not looking real happy, is he? But uh, over on the right, it says that you can see uh, four states can be seen. On the back of this, the guy's written, as close to heaven as I will ever likely get. And I, I just thought that was a great sentiment. But you had these cars, and uh, anybody happen to know just a show of hands on where the names came from? They were named after the characters on the uh, Amos and Andy radio show, which was popular at the time, was sponsored by a, a local radio station, and they got the uh, rights to put the names on the, on the cars. They also were very smart. They took one of the cars as they were building the fair, they put it downtown sh in Chicago, had a sign out here about come and see the rocket ride, and it was a great way of getting the, uh, the buzz built up. If you look at this, there's a very definite front on the left side, the tail on the right side, and they would admit smoke coming out the back. And if anybody is familiar with the old uh, Buck Rogers uh, spaceships uh, or Flash Gordon, you know, the way they'd fly around and uh, they'd always have smoke coming out the back and everything, Th these things were very much taken out of that sort of uh, genre. But this is the sort of view you got from up top. Uh, if we look back over in the uh, uh, center left, you can see the bandstand that we saw first going in. It was just uh, uh, all this land being reclaimed. It was a wonderful addition for the, uh, the city. You had this planetarium, which had been built not part of the fair, but now the fair was gonna encompass it. Uh, so what happened basically was for the two years of the fair, you got free admission into the planetarium. And the planetarium is still there in Chicago today, greatly expanded and new equipment and everything. But uh, it was one of the first planetariums of its type, very popular. So having people come and see it as part of the fair was a, a, a real plus for fair goers. And this is kind of an innocuous little building, um, doesn't look like an awful lot, but it was actually the first building built for the fair. And one of the things they did was to find out all the construction materials they were going to use, would they work on this particular building? So again, you're building it on the landfill, you've got the uh, you know, winter weather coming in, how, how would this type of plaster work? How would this type of electrical fitting work? All that sort of thing. So uh, then during the fair, it was used for as an exhibition building. We're continuing walking along and we get to a few international pavilions. And what was very interesting was that most of the international pavilions that were done at the fair were done by nations that had large uh, expatriate populations in the Chicago area. So they asked, for example, Swedish Americans to help contribute to their pavilion. Then they would also ask them to work at the pavilion or to perform at the pavilion. And as I mentioned in other fairs like Expo 86 used the same model to huge success. 
Now everybody that was Swedish American uh, was going to go to the fair and see the Swedish American pavilion, even if you were from New York or something, because now you got a chance to go see your uncles and aunts who lived out near Chicago. You got to go see the pavilion. You had every, you know, uh, marching band or performing dance group, whatever, would come and perform at these. Czechoslovakia had a huge uh, population in the Chicago area, and they would uh, have Czechoslovakian days. By the way, on all these pictures, these are all amateur shots that were taken at the fair. I, I think I have maybe, maybe two publicity pictures in here. So in this one, you've got a giant beam for this, uh, something going right in front of Czechoslovakia. I always try to use candid pictures to try to show what people felt were important as they went to the fair, knowing that again, film was uh, expensive. It was a pain in the butt to get it developed and everything. But these were the things that people thought were ex uh, exciting or different about the fair and the things I find are, are of interest. What's that? It okay. I don't know if no, I think it's just yours. Sorry, Car Carol was having some pr problems with connection. Is everybody else seeing everything okay? Yeah, I'm fine here. Fine. Okay. Fine. Her computer's been acting up on her the last couple of days. So uh, now I know what I'll do this afternoon in between running to the pool. Now, every World's Fair seems to have to have an exhibit that makes you say, what the hell were they thinking? I mean, uh, there's, there's always one. You just try to figure out, you know, why did anybody think that this was going to work? And in this one, we're looking from the Sky Tower, and we're looking at something called Jensen's Beach. And it was exactly what it was. It was a beach. You would go out to the World's Fair, pay your money to get in, have to haul your bathing suit, haul your towels, flip-flops, or whatever, Go to the changing room, go out and swim, and then you'd have to carry this stuff around for the rest of the day again. Or you could go to the, any one of the other many beaches all along the exact same lake and pay zero money and not have to pay, you know, and haul the stuff around all day. So how on earth they ever thought that this was going to be a, a popular thing is amazing to me. If you look at this picture, you can see next to nobody at the beach, and I will defy you to find a picture of the beach being crowded. When the fair returned in uh, 1934, the beach did not. There were some really unusual exhibits. This one is great. Um, anybody, uh, I, I worked as some people may know as a submarine designer when I got out of, out of college and uh, I had a real appreciation for them. And uh, this one was different. Anybody here happen to own their own submarine? This guy, this was a privately owned submarine. It was not uh, built, it was built by the Navy, the S-49 had been built by the Navy and sold as surplus. And the Navy felt that, you know, what's anybody going to do with a surplus submarine? They're going to cut it up and they're going to, uh, you know, scrap metal. Well, this guy that bought it decided, no, I'm going to take it and I'm going to sail around in my submarine. I'm going to go to different cities and charge people to see it. So if you look up on top, he's got a pair of loudspeakers to tell people, come and see the amazing S-49. So he would take it up and down the uh, the, the various rivers and uh, you know, stop at county fairs and that sort of thing, and you could go and tour his own submarine. He then, World War II came by, and he got a little nervous that uh, hmm, people are going to think this is a U-boat, and they're going to come and bomb it. So he sold it back to the U.S. Navy, who was going to use it to train people on, and they made a mistake, and they accidentally sunk the submarine. And it's, uh, it's still out there in one of the rivers uh, off of Maryland today as a popular diving attraction. But I got a kick out of, uh, I, I imagine, you know, just I want to go visit Chicago, I'll just motor up there in my submarine. You also had another interesting set of uh, uh, boats here. This guy is showing a replica of sponge diving. Uh, these guys came all the way up from Florida. They came uh, up through the, uh, the canals and uh, the uh, St. Lawrence Seaway to get up there. And they had a underwater building that you could go down and watch through a, a glass uh, tank and uh, windows, watch the guys doing sponge diving. Uh, they lost their proverbial shirts in this. Uh, turned out people were not particularly interested in seeing simulated sponge diving. When they had to uh, take the boat back home, uh, they were trying to go somewhere. Uh, for some reason, I think there was the Panama Canal. They ended up getting malaria. Uh, it was just a, an adventure as you read the uh, accounts of the time, it was uh, why not to have an exhibit at a World's Fair that you cannot make money at because you might get malaria. This was uh, the United States, or it's called the Federal B Pavilion. Very, very sleek design, uh, very, very nice. And we'll take a look in the courtyard here. You had many of the states had pavilions here, and 
it was designed that each of them had an equal frontage on it, and then you could have different pavilions. Uh, uh, you had the state seal on top, but you could also have uh, different uh, things inside as far as the, the culture of your state, the uh, col economy, ecology, whatever the state. Some states decided that this shared approach wasn't good enough for them. So you see California in the center here. Well, we're gonna see another California coming up. They decided they needed two pavilions. You also had other states like Florida went on outside of this big garden outside because Florida was such a, a nice uh, garden type of environment, trying to lure people down from the frigid areas of Chicago, come on down to uh, visit us in Florida. So they had uh, palm trees and fruit trees and er everything out there. So you can see a palm tree, I don't know if my mouse shows up here, but right in the center, palm trees this is the first time anybody had seen any of them in, in Chicago. You also had different industries. You had the dairy industries uh, showing their pavilion and you could go in and watch cows being milked and the milkers of the future. Uh, you had other international pavilions as you came by. And you can see here, uh, big signs for Viva Il Duce, the, uh, you know, Mussolini was in, in charge over in Italy at the time, and there was a, a big thing here about saluting him and all the progressive things he was doing in Italy that was, um, again, World War II and w the things we found out about were unknown at the time. But you also had a big thing about Marconi invented the radio. And in this particular uh, pavilion, the Italians actually sent a huge armada of uh, airplanes that flew all the way over from Italy to uh, the United States made a big circle over the fair, landed a uh, huge uh, celebration to have them coming there. And one of the very few markers left on the World's Fair site is a marker uh, commemorating that, that flight of the Italian uh, Air Force. And many of these pavilions also had, again, ethnic restaurants to uh, both keep their local communities happy, but maybe this was the first time somebody tried Italian food or Czechoslovakian food or Swedish food. So. The restaurants at the fair became very, very popular. And in 1934, there were even more of them added because people realized in the uh, uh, economy was coming back, people were looking to go out. And for this, uh, it, it sounds very strange to many of us today, but the 33, 34 World's Fair was the first time a lot of people actually went to a restaurant. They'd always had all their meals at home or with families or whatever. And now you could go to a restaurant and somebody would bring you the food. And this was a whole giant new growing industry. One thing a lot of fairs have are fun zones, and this uh, one had it too. Um, it had a uh, uh, double Ferris, uh, uh, Ferris wheel. You just didn't have a Ferris wheel, but you had two of them going around. You also had to have some, uh, basically every fair comes and comes up with new rides. So this was one that was uh, specified was gonna be the ride of the century. You would go up in this tower in these uh, cars, it would drop you on a track and you would come swinging that back and forth all the way down to the bottom and uh, then you would go and repeat it. Well, like many other things, it's very easy to do one of these on paper. It's not as easy to actually build it or to finance it. So the ride of the century that was proposed became the thrill of a century, which was a giant slide that you walked up to the top, got a piece of burlap and slid all the way down to the, uh, the bottom. And that was the thrill of a century. This one I got a real kick out of the Midway ride. This was uh, one that you got in the car, you went all the way up to the top, and you just came down in a dizzying circle of uh, uh, you know, a spiral all the way down to the bottom. You can see it says the tower dip. And I always, I'd like to find a, a pictures of the people getting off of this to see how if they could possibly walk a straight line. I remember when we were building Space Mountain at Disneyland, one of the, my jobs was getting cast members to go ride it. And we'd asked them to ride it five, six times nonstop because we were trying to do some measurements of weight and speed and that. And you find that people after going through five, six times of Space Mountain, they could often, they'd kind of walk in uh, sort of not straight lines as they were coming out. A, a ride in the tower dip would probably have been exciting. You also had all these different things, uh, the various uh, uh, fun houses, uh, freak shows, all sorts of things that were uh, scattered along it. And this was one thing that was interesting. You had these uh, scales that people would guess your weight. And it turned out of all the things they had at the fair, this turned out to be the thing that caused the policemen the most amount of trouble. You can see one of them here uh, having a, a discussion with them because these guys would get out and get into arguments with the, uh, the customers and start uh, basically trying to sell them things. You can see there's 
set of canes on the left that the, you know, they were basically a, a sun, sun shades, that sort of thing. But they would get into arguments with them because their scale was slightly off. So you'd come by and you'd say, well, I know I weigh 182. And the guy would guess that you weigh 185. And you say, no, I weigh 182. And you get on the scale and of course he'd be right, you'd be wrong. And people would come and say, I was cheated, I want my money back. So if you go through the files for the fair uh, organization, these scales were the biggest source of problems that they had. For the two years of the fair, they had very little problems with uh, the crowds other than uh, in the amusement areas where they served alcohol, they had nudism, and at the end of the fair, when everybody decided we had to take a piece of the fair home with us. So for the most part, most people behave themselves, uh, but then when again, you, you mix uh, alcohol, nudism, and uh, you know mania, they, the, they did have some very busy nights of the fair. So we're gonna cross over the bridge here. It's a bridge of science. We're gonna go across this man-made lagoon. Again, everything across the bridge is man-made landfill. And this is an interesting pavilion, uh, Social Science Hall. For those of us who've been at the 64 World's Fair, this was their version of the Better Living Center or the Hall of Education. The idea was anybody that wants to be at the fair, we rent you a stall inside this building. You don't need to build your own uh, pavilion. You can come out here and have an exhibit. Well, it was full of basically junk and uh, got just lousy reviews and why on earth people keep repeating that in every other World's Fair? Because uh, just basically every World's Fair has a thing for the mom and pop vendors to be in. And they get so desperate for it that they don't, uh, don't properly screen them. But right near it, you had the electric uh, pavilion. Uh, great uh, artwork along the sides of it, you can see here. This was all electric. Uh, everything was just big and coming. And there were so many things that were new at this particular fair. The type of lights, things we take granted for today for neon lights, different types of electric lights like this fountain. And I'll go into some of the night views of the fair as we get to the end. But massive displays about how electricity was going to help in all sorts of ways. And uh, they really went way out of their way to theme electrical and lighting into the design of the buildings. We also had RCA was there, and you see up on the top here, the guys up on the roof, he's got the World Series scoreboard and he's uh, manually posting it. Back at this time, radio was king. They did have a very, very early display of television at the 33 World's Fair. Most people think about television having been unveiled at the 39 World's Fair. Well, that was commercially available television. RCA had a television, uh, system where you could go and see yourself on television, but it was a massive thing, basically uh, the size of, basically bigger than the size of two refrigerators and huge lights. If you, any of you guys remember my, in my house at Christmas time, we'd come down our stairs and my dad would pick and taken all these Christmas movies of us. We had these spotlights, which just blind you, you know, to get anything on, on the, on the film. Well, that's what the television of uh, 1933 was. So radio was real big and uh, all these people are outside getting the update for the, the World Series. You also had different gardens. Uh, all sorts of companies were uh, asked to come in and do gardens, formal gardens. You could come out if you wanted to do, um, you know, buy the latest in, in roses or different plants. You could go and order them, have them delivered right uh, to your house from the fair. Mentioned California had two pavilions. You had this one here again with a garden area, but this was going back to the uh, uh, Spanish colonial days of, of California. You had other international pavilions sometimes willy nilly mixed in with the, uh, the state pavilion. So you could go and see everything that was from the Egypt, lots of displays from there. You could continue further down, you had the Hall of Science, and this was one of the main structures of the fair. Very, uh, very interesting building, very sleek in its design. Matter of fact, somebody on uh, line the other day posted a picture of a shopping center that looked like a scaled down version of exactly that building that somebody was so impressed by it that they went and copied it and built a shopping center using that tower as a central uh, anchoring point of it. What you had here, this was the display used to the opening of the fair. They figured that a light from the star Octaurus from 1893, the time of the last World's Fair, would just reach Chicago in time for the 1933 World's Fair. So they had up above, you can see these different observatories that are mentioned. And they were saying that the light of the star is coming and it's hit this observatory, this observatory, this observatory, it's hit a photo cell 
here in Chicago, and now we declare the World's Fair officially open. Obviously a gimmick, you know, that how did they know that light didn't get there yesterday or get there tomorrow? They were not that precise that it got there at just that moment, but it was a, a great thing, and this board was up uh, for the uh, time of the fair selling the virtues of, uh, you know, instant communication. This is the same hall, but obviously not much of this set of displays, is it? Kind of dull. Well, one of the things they did was, as they built the 33 fair, they actually had open houses. You could come out there and buy a ticket, wander through the fairgrounds, and it was great. It was did two things, just like they did with Expo 86. You saw the pavilions, you got excited, you told all your friends about it, but you also now just threw some money into the kitty to help feed the construction to build the rest of the fair. So it was really kind of interesting that you could go and wander through this construction zone. It wasn't quite as wild as some uh, fairs like the, the Seattle World's Fair. You could just walk through it any day of the week. Well, this one, they were a little smarter. They actually charged admission. They had uh, uh, different railings up to keep people from going where they weren't supposed to go. But a lot of people took pictures of going out to the fair and started sending it back home, you know, folks and telling people that you got to come and see this. And inside, they had all sorts of scientific displays. This is a bathosphere. You had a thing here explaining about all about how there's different uh, branches of science and how everything ties together into the so-called tree of knowledge, giant murals, and unfortunately these things have been lost over time. Uh, this set of uh, metal figures was, I think it's, I have it in the book, I'm not gonna bother looking it up right now, but uh, they're still existing today in a university setting. And again, giant artwork that they had done. Mo almost all this artwork is just like the 39 New York World's Fair done with plaster. Uh, not meant to be po uh, permanent, because again, this World's Fair was only planned to be uh, one year. Um, I'll get more into that later, but this was, it was always the 1933 World's Fair. It was going to be a one-year fair, so everything only had to last six months, so why do you do a stone statue if you do plaster? It's a lot cheaper. This is one of the preview days. Again, you could come and get uh, a view on Greyhound that they would take you around and show you the pavilion. This pavilion, by the way, turned out to be so big that not all the upper levels of it got to be used, the, uh, the science pavilion. So uh, in some cases they overbuilt, but they, they still end up looking pretty nice. Another view looking down from the, uh, the tower. By the way, if people are chatting, I can't see it. I'll look at the chats at the end of it, but if it's something urgent, please uh, pop up and let me know. So we're gonna be going further along uh, up the river, uh, the lake rather, I'm saying river because there's a river boat off to the side where they had uh, docked out there and they had uh, performance shows. Um, again, some of these buildings are custom built for individual exhibitors. Others for general purpose halls, like the four of them you see stretching off to the right. Uh, this, those buildings tended to have more major developers that weren't the uh, type that were just uh, come and throw something together. Time Magazine, big display, uh, very interesting. People that collect magazines were trying to figure out which issues they had done in giant covers of the Time and Fortune. Turned out none, they were fake covers made just for the fair so they didn't have to keep changing them out over time. Uh, you had Admiral Byrd, he had this ship he had saw, sailed to the South Pole and you could come on board and, and uh, uh, tour it. It was there early, it was part of the uh, display of the uh, preview days but you could come out there and it, this was a big thing at the time. This ship had been all the way to the South Pole and I think it was one of the first ones to do it so you could come and get tours of it. Christian Science was really popular, uh, not just because you could go and sit in a comf comfortable chair and read uh, the Christian Science magazines, but because they had something really new and exciting called air conditioning. So most of the fair was not air conditioned. Christian Science was, attendance was up, somebody was real smart. You had different international pavilions. You had China, you had Japan, you had a whole bunch of them coming in. You had performers coming from the various countries. So in some cases, these are local people that were performing. Other cases, they actually came from the countries and they would start a tour uh, at the fair, go through the United States. Like we see them on here in TV all the time in LA for different, uh, every year these Chinese acrobats come to LA. Uh, this year, they're you know trying to convince you that you're not gonna get uh, uh, what you call it, Corona, you know, everything's safe. But then you tour the U.S., you go back to Chicago, and then you, you fly home from there. This temple was one that a wealthy businessman built. It was a replica of a, a temple, and he, uh, he spent a fortune on it. 
I mean, all handcrafted. And this ended up then being later reused at the 1939 New York World's Fair. Uh, and I understand it's still in storage and pieces, hoping to be <clears throat> rebuilt someday, but now people are sensitive to whether or not that's cultural appropriation. So the pieces are still in a warehouse. Whether it will ever be put back together, we'll find out. Firestone, you could go in and find out how tires were made, and you could watch tires be made, and you could smell tires being made. Sinclair, for those of us, the 64 World's Fair fans, we get a kick. We had the Sinclair dinosaurs were at this fair. They were a little bit more, uh, oh, shall we say, rough than the 64 World's Fair, but they were also animated. So in this battle, the T-Rex would move his uh, head back and forth, the uh, brontosaurus would move, and they had uh, sounds, recording uh, sounds of the battle roaring all along. And these were as uh, accurate as they felt that, that they were at the time. And they actually got pretty good press from uh, the uh, uh, scientific community for representation of the animals. And here you had one million years ago, you had dinosaurs there. And Joey in the center, you'll be very happy. There's a giant gorilla there, prehistoric animals brought to life. I love it. I love yeah. it. Uh, we'll get to more gorillas for you. Then you had a children's playground, and this was kind of interesting. Uh, this guy up here, he always reminds me of something out of uh, uh, Pinocchio, where they go off to Pleasure Island. Well, this was Treasure Island, and uh, it was, uh, uh, you had this train going around, but it was kind of interesting. You know, you keep doing research on these things, and you keep learning new things. Mentioned in the talk I did about Disney and World's Fair is that I had asked uh, the archives, did Walt ever go to the 33 World's Fair? And they said, yes, they just haven't found a picture of him there. But they found this uh, uh, newspaper ad about see how these cartoons are made direct from the World's Fair. And this ran in the newspaper after the 33 Fair ended. So we said, OK, see how the M Mickey Mouse and the Three Little Pigs were made. We're trying to figure out, I wonder where that was at the fair. Well, Disney didn't know. Well, now I can tell Disney they were here at the Hollywood Pavilion. You can see right there, animated movie cartoons in the making. So it's one of the things I enjoy doing all this research because different pieces of things keep coming to be. I didn't know which cartoons they had showed. Disney didn't know where they were. And now, now we both know. Well, also in looking at this, I had come across this, this picture. And as I was restoring and taking out all the dirt and scratches, I happened to see in the background there that there was the Mickey Mouse shop. And as we did research, this appears to be the prototype for all the Disney stores that are sucking money out of us left and right all these many years ago. So this is the first known shop dedicated to uh, the Disney merchandise. You also had all sorts of other things at the, rant, uh, at the area. You could come out, you could do pony rides, you could have a great time with that. You could get in a motorboat, and these were not on a track. You actually took them out on the lake, and you see there was a boom out there, which kept you from getting into the lagoon and just sailing off. But huge crowds would come out here and line it and watch all the people who did not know how to uh, drive a motorboat play bumper boat accidentally as they took it back to the dock. Huge thermometer here. Today, boy, we'd be way up there today, most of the country, wouldn't we? that uh, they would measure uh, the heat up there, uh, light it up, not with a giant tube of mercury, but with giant lights. This was a real big thing. Incubators were really still new at the time. Um, it's hard, again, hard to believe about premature babies and putting them on display, but they had this at the 33 fair. We saw it a couple weeks ago at the uh, 39 fair. Uh, and they actually would bring people that had premature babies, put them on display out here at the fair. Uh, had medical doctors on, on uh, scene 24 hours a day and provide care for these kids. And it ended up funding the uh, use of more incubators going across uh, the, uh, the country at the time. So kind of a horrible sort of thing to put your kid on display in an incubator at a World's Fair. It turned out the parents were very appreciative because they said, hey, my kid may not have lived if he hadn't been there at the World's Fair. So it turned out to be a, a well-received thing in that regard. And you had other things that were also well received. You had the baby incubators off to the right and right next to it, the streets of Paris. And you could go in there and see all these wonderful things where you've got real Latin atmosphere with bars and everything else. No cover charges. And you could also, uh, if you started reading between the lines, it meant uh, no cover on the ladies that were gonna be dancing at these shows. You had uh, all sorts of international themes here. You had uh, this hall here at the old Heidelberg restaurant. Uh, there were all sorts of restaurants and themed things that were done to uh, 
again, not just be a, a, a snack bar, but to be something of excitement to get to go to. This was interesting, the Century Grill Atlas Special. Anybody happen to know what Atlas Special was? Non-alcoholic beer, because 1933, we still had prohibition. So you could go out there and you could get this non-alcoholic beer. These kids are munching away, and I get a kick out of this. They're at the World's Fair and they're all wearing ties. You know, things have changed, right? But, you know, everybody's well-dressed and everything, and they're going out there. So the Century Grill was really special about how you could get their special brew. You could go out and you could see these uh, very different uh, things that were uh, done in uh, uh, this, the Moroccan village. You could come out and you could ride on different uh, animals. Joey, you could come out here and see an actual uh, exhibit. And for the folks that don't know, know it, Joey does uh, gorilla costumes, uh, entertains at things. So you could see real gorillas at the Gorilla Villa. You could go to the Midget Village. Now, this is something obviously you wouldn't do today, but you could go in and you could see a number of little people that were living there, uh, all scaled down, and they had, uh, you know, uh, different shops, uh, stores, everything that was done to their particular scale. So that's a bunch of them. Those are not children. They're little people standing off to the right. That was done at a number of World's Fairs, and this was a very large uh, exhibit at this particular one. Again, an Oriental Village. You had people uh, selling you uh, stuff from their various uh, countries, uh, bazaars, that sort of thing. You could go off and get your picture taken on a camel, uh, you know, all sorts of fun things. And here we end up at the Belgian village. Again, uh, the thing that started my whole interest in this, if we look, walk up to this, you're looking very much thinking about the 30, uh, 64 World's Fair, the exact same bell tower, the exact same entrance. Turned out what happened was this guy that had built his village had taken plaster molds off of real buildings over in Belgium, came back and built these for the uh, 33 World's Fair. They later reused some of them to rebuild part of a Belgian village at Expo 58 in Brussels, and they used the exact same molds to build the Belgian village at the 64 World's Fair. So it's very familiar. You go in there and you get these exact same buildings. And sometimes the buildings are once to the left or where it was the other fair, or maybe they took off a story or something. <laughs> but basically all the stonework, all the uh, angels and figures on the churches and everything were molds that were uh, used uh, from real things in Belgium, used in Chicago, used in Belgium again, back to New York. You had the, this one is really great. It's a, uh, can't really read the sign too well, but you can come and get a full course meal in here with your American Express coupon. Because American Express would say you train tours to the uh, fair. They put you in an American Express approved hotel after you rode an American Express train. And now you could go in and get your meal all done just using coupons. So people knowing when they went to the fair, they didn't have to bring a tremendous amount of cash if you went on one of these American Express tours and everything was uh, pre-done for you. This was a whole set of houses that were built along the, uh, the lake. Uh, if you want to build a house out of glass blocks to show how well glass can be an insulator, you could come and see that. You could see uh, modern houses that were done with different types of construction. Uh, this one here uh, had its own airplane hangar that was in it. Uh, this one was a house all built out of bricks. Some of these houses were totally demolished after the fair ended. Some were put on barges, floated across the lake and are in a state park right now that you can still tour their, uh, the, the houses. Even you could see what a log cabin built out of cypress logs would have been like. John's Manville was there because you wanted to build your house. And what did John Mansville sell? Asbestos. So you got to go and see all about the wonders of asbestos and all the wonderful things that you could do if you filled your house, your business, your factory, your office, your schools, as much as asbestos as possible. Then we come down, uh, mentioned before Illinois had a very good presence there. And one of the uh, big part of it was Fort Dearborn, recreating the uh, original stockade that had been built there in Chicago uh, years ago. You also had a big exhibit on Abraham Lincoln, uh, so you could entrance the famous Lincoln Village. This was a replica of the house that uh, he had been born in. The wigwam was, a, I think this was a three-quarter scale replica of uh, one of the uh, halls that uh, was used during his political campaigning. Uh, this was uh, one of the few black community houses that had been moved uh, as Chicago was growing up. 
you know, uh, urban renewal was something they did back then that they do now, get up and tend to move things out of the way. Luckily, sometimes things were saved, they weren't destroyed. And this is an example of Marquette was a priest that uh, came and lived out here. And this was, a, I think this was a replica. I don't think this was the real thing, but this was a cabin that he lived in in 1675 as he was exploring the, uh, the area. Again, looking out over the area, you could come and you could, uh, they had uh, Native Americans would actually camp in these teepees. You could go and they could uh, watch beadwork being done. He's making a vase here. You could buy things that, that were made. Uh, they actually would sell a lot of things at the Indian trading post here that were uh, made at the uh, fair. But the Indians that live there will also tend to buy their stuff. So that, you know, the old story about the, you know, only you're sold to the company store they would sell things at the company store, but they'd buy things at the company store and not too many of the Indians fared really well at the end of this and their overall profitability. This amazing pavilion they built, a Mayan temple. They, again, they went down to an actual uh, set of runes, took uh, castings, came back and built this entire thing. If you see hand tinted pictures of this, it's amazing the, the color that was in it. I don't have any actual live color photos of it. You had a big car displays, General Motors was there, a huge exhibit, of course, you know, uh, everybody was now trying to get you to buy cars, depression's over, you need to have a, a company car or family car. Inside, you could see all these displays of how the cars are being made, um, you know, different things, and you could actually go and try to win a car and take it home with you. Chrysler had a huge pavilion there, and out back they had a stunt show. So we see the uh, side of the fairground here. There's a set of uh, bandstand or grandstands here, and people would uh, do a thing here trying to uh, flip the cars over and uh, basically show you how great Chrysler cars were. You had the Hall of Transportation. This is a very interesting building. It had next to no interior supports. All those towers on the outside held up the building from those towers which meant you could put a tremendous amount of interior exhibit space inside, uh, which is exactly the same sort of thing done, say, in 1964 for the uh, NCR building. So uh, the uh, uh, different idea of coming up with different construction techniques, World's Fairs were a great way to do that. Excuse me one second. <clears throat> I get so emotional, so choked up over this. They had a big display about transportation. I uh, think here we're looking at a barge on the Erie Canal, but uh, they would bring trains out to meet themselves. Uh, boats would come out and be part of the show. It was a, a big a exhibit area. And you would have different tr famous trains brought in. Here is the General. The General was the uh, train from the gro Great Locomotive Chase, uh, where Andrews Raiders stole it to try to disrupt the uh, Confederate rails. It uh, has been at a whole bunch of World's Fairs, including the 39 and 64 New York World's Fairs. Uh, for folks that are on the, our Facebook group about the 64 Fair, we're always talking about what we call the ever-present nuns, that nuns are uh, drawn to World's Fairs, and I can only imagine how hot it was out there as they were enjoying the general. But they brought trains in from around the world. The Royal Scot came in. Uh, in some cases, you had some issues that the foreign trains, uh, their tracks were different uh, size than U.S. tracks, so they were uh, only brought here, put on display. And others, they actually chugged across the country, uh, doing, a, again, great uh, publicity for the, the fair as they went. And they had some replicas of uh, old trains, or in, actual, in some cases, the actual old trains themselves. So railroads were a huge part of American life in 1933. Uh, so you did not have a big display of, about airplanes. You did not have a lot of uh, uh, things about, um, you know, other types of transportation because the train was uh, king. You also had ranches you could go into and uh, some of these ranches were nude ranches uh, and others were just replica of old mining towns. So you could go walk in and you could get a haircut, you could uh, pan for gold, you could uh, visit here The Undertaker. You could go to different shows, so we're watching these guys from Oregon do a log rolling exhibition here. Or you could go to one of the largest chicken farms that was around and you could see all the different types of chickens and uh, how they were being raised in very humane uh, conditions. You could go to different restaurants. I just love this building, uh, you know, all made out of wood, just uh, massive uh, things that a lot of these international pavilions were actually built
built uh, either by craftsmen from that uh, nation originally constructed there, then brought over here and put back together. In some cases, they were built totally here by local, uh, cra uh, by the foreign craftsmen who came over. But the, uh, like in the Japan Pavilion, they did it totally without uh, nails. It was all done by wooden pegs. So there's a lot of real uh, authentic uh, uh, construction techniques used in them. You had the uh, old Mexico Pavilion, and you can see here that the log rollers were having a big wedding. So romance at the fair. You did also, as I mentioned, you didn't have a lot of aviation, but Goodyear, they brought the blimp out. You could go for rides in the Goodyear blimp. Uh, it's, I've always wanted to get a ride in a Goodyear blimp. Someday I hope to get a ride in a Goodyear blimp, but back here you could take a tour and it was about a 15 minute ride around. Or if you were really rich, you could come out to the uh, fair by seaplane. So they actually had a service that you, they could pick you up at different points up and down the lake, take you out here, drop you off at the fair, you come around and get back on your seaplane to go home at the, at the end of the day. Or if you wanted to get around the fair, you had these, uh, uh, rickshaws, and these were basically college-type athletes, so the guy on the left looks a little old for college to me, but they would tour you around the fair, and I ended up with a number of photo albums I bought of, um, uh, from people that went to the fair, and it, it was very interesting to see how many of the women tourists evidently were quite taken by these uh, gentlemen uh, taking them around the fair for the day. Well, that was fair in 33. It ended like most fairs do, uh, had lost money, but it hadn't lost a lot of money. And people started doing some pencil sharpening and calculating that, you know, if we came back for another year, we might make money on this thing because we've already built the buildings. We've already, uh, you know, we had so much of the sunk cost to put the, uh, fill in the ground, build the roads, put in the electrical wires. Uh, you know, I think if we come back for the next year, we could actually turn this into a profit. So they looked at it and said, yeah, yeah, let's, let's do that. Well, it was real interesting because the thing, and that's, it started confusing me. I had the like, guidebooks and there would be no mention of Ford in the, the guidebook, but there's obviously, I'm looking at a picture of Ford. Well, it turned out Ford was only there in 1934. Henry Ford had seen no value in a World's Fair in 1933. Then when he saw all the pictures of all the crowds going to the Chrysler and the GM pavilions, he decided he had to be there in 34. So now, ah, there's a 34 guidebook and Ford's in that. So about 40% of the fair was different for, uh, the, between the two fairs, between things that didn't work like the beach, uh, different pavilions got knocked down and then others got added. So Ford came with the Wonder Rotunda, a big display of their uh, products. They also came with the Ford Industrialized Barn, which uh, Henry Ford was a big believer in soybeans and how you could make all sorts of things like imitation plastics and stuff out of soybeans and was showing some of that off. They also had this road w which you could ride around on and it would show you uh, how Ford's road on dirt road, wood roads, log roads, stone roads, and the background of Ford uh, bandstand. So he went way out of his way and he's right over here with his competitors here, right in front of them, so everybody would see all the Ford products. You also had villages galore. We, before we mentioned we had the uh, Belgian village, we had an Oriental village. Well, people came out and they started building village after village after village. So you had the Black Forest, and inside you went around, and we're in Chicago, and uh, you know, middle of summer, it didn't matter. You still had your frozen icicles, you had snow on the roof. Uh, you know, very, very nice theming to these uh, international buildings. And you could even watch uh, people out here doing ice skating. So uh, the snow on the side of it is all fake, as you'll see, but, you know, they had uh, refrigeration. They come out and do their ice skating and put on shows and jump over barrels and that. Uh, Switzerland had a nice pavilion there. And it's interesting, this um, statue here was uh, taken from molds of a real statue over in Switzerland. Well, years later, the real statue, somebody drove a truck into it on accident and destroyed it in large part. And they ended up taking pictures and things they had done when they built this copy of it and were able to use that as a guideline and how to put the real one back together again. So again, you had more dancers. Uh, you had fake Alps behind you, people playing music, dancing. You had the colonial village. America couldn't be left out. So on the left, you have the Spanish village. On the right, you had the colonial village. You could go inside and see uh, copies of colonial houses. Inside, people would show you how, it's just like going to Williamsburg today. 
we're going to show you the silversmith, the candlesmith, all that sort of thing. Or you could go and have uh, uh, a nice meal and a replica inside of, uh, of uh, George Washington's place, uh, Mount Vernon. Uh, again, you could go and visit the streets of Shanghai. You could go over to Holland and watch people dancing in wooden shoes. Uh, you could go to Ireland and you could watch people doing line dancing. So huge, huge international presence with all these. And again, to give you an idea, all these were just done for six months. These are things that were added for 1940 and the amount of detail that it went into. I mean, if you walk into this, you'd really think you were going through a street in old London. So you could see the old cheese shop. Of course, again, for the time, Godiva and Peeping Tom, because again, nudity sold at a lot of these, these particular shows. Uh, here you have a replica of uh, Old Vic, the theater. Uh, Eleanor Roosevelt came and actually gave a, a talk here on the radio, and uh, they would do a very small, scaled-down version of Shakespeare shows that, again, people didn't want to be there for two hours and miss part of the fair. So now we're going to give you, uh, you know, Macbeth in 32 minutes sort of thing. So it was a very popular thing. And it was the first exposure, a lot of people got to Shakespearean stuff. Again, Mexican village, real popular. Uh, and again, the Italian village. You see the Italian village, Sally Rand. Sally Rand was the famous fan dancer, bubble dancer. She uh, was very big into nudism. So uh, Ernie Young's review, they played the music of Sally Rand, did the dancing. Uh, you had other music. These bandstands were added for the, uh, the 40 season of the fair. They also added a giant fountain out in the middle of the lake. Again, they put a lot of time and effort into making the 40 fair a standalone fair of its own, that if you had gone to 39, that wasn't good enough. You needed to come back and see what they had done for 40. They really went way out on all this stuff. Here, this guy's in a cage full of lions. Uh, they had other ones where you'd be in death-defying motorcycles uh, with going through things of flame. So Standard Oil had a whole series of things where they would do death-defying acts throughout the, the time of the fair. Different gardens you could go to, uh, again, expanding on what they had done from um, the 33 season. This one here, Criders uh, Gardens and Criders, still a nursery company that's still around today. So you could go and see their exhibit. And they took a lot of the pieces that were at this fair, like these, I don't remember, exa for example, uh, if the uh, windmill is the exact one that's there, but they did take a number of things that were there for 34 and moved it to their facility today. You could go and see the wonders of Wonder Bread. My wife Bill? always gets a, yes. Sorry, um, you kept referring to 40, 1940 fair? You yeah, 34? Uh, 30, 34, I'm oh, sorry. Okay. Yes, I was thank. just wondering, I was getting confused. Oh, no, no, thank you. I, 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 I confused myself, sorry. Now everybody knows why Carol edits my books for me. Uh, another thing in 1934 that was very popular is beer was back. The end of Prohibition, you could go off and have beer wagons deliver around the fair. So beer was a big thing. Mentioned earlier that uh, the fair had been well designed with night in mind. And this is an example of looking across the lagoon at the federal building. They really went out of their way to style these buildings from the initial design that lighting was an integral part of the design. It wasn't an add-on, it wasn't an afterthought. It was what the buildings are designed to showcase. So the Hall of Science at night, you had a combination of incandescent lights, you had fluorescent lights, you had neon lights. It was all very, very well done. General Motors at night again. And these pictures had to be taken by someone with a tripod. The film at the time was very slow. You just didn't grab it. But uh, the lighting of these things was just remarkable to see the, uh, the fair at night. Chrysler at night, you get an idea. You couldn't see this during the day, but the glass facade of the building, uh, there were copies of all the, uh, the Chrysler cars inside. It, that's one of the nice things with these nice shots is sometimes you can end up seeing inside the buildings for things you weren't able to tell during the, the day. The Hall of Transportation. Bird ship. I mean, again, look at all the lights on the lagoon and everything behind it. The lights all strung along the towers of the uh, the uh, the uh, ride in the background. Ford, even its pavilion, a late edition, lit up. And look at the towers of light just going to the sky. Just <laughs> imagine how far away you could see these things. And if you were in Chicago and looking across town and seeing that lit up at night, I imagine a lot of people say, "Hey, Dad, can you, we go out to the fair?" So fireworks show at night, uh, very popular, uh, fair, uh, very successful. Now, 
Unfortunately, like all good things that comes to an end, there was actually talk about, hey, we actually made money on this fair. You know, the second year turned out to be really profitable, just like we thought. We, uh, <clears throat> we had turned a profit. We were making money. Why don't we come back for 35? And why don't we keep going? Almost the thought of becoming a permanent addition to the uh, Chicago uh, landscape. Luckily, a few people said, nah, let's not push our luck on this. First of all, these buildings are supposed to last six months. They've already gone two years now, and they've been through two Chicago winters. Uh, we don't really want to push our luck on all this. So there were plans that they would keep pieces of it. I mentioned Fort Dearborn, uh, the, the wooden stockade. That was left. There were a couple other things that were left behind. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Fort Dearborn later burned down in a fire. Uh, but the intent, again, was just like in 64, it was intended to become a park area. They uh, also ended up putting an airport out there, Meigs Field, which was well known to us who were Microsoft uh, flight simulator fans for years. So unfortunately, after two years, it got torn down. As I mentioned, if you go out there today, there's very little left of the World's Fair itself. Um, uh, you know, a couple markers here or there, but most of it's gone. So that's the, the look. We'll do a q and I'll see the chat so I can see all the mistakes I made. Uh, I guess if I gave away a dollar for every time I said 1940, I'd go broke. But uh, again, worldsfairphotos.com slash Zoom. I have the schedules there. I, I don't know what I'm going to do next week. I want to talk about that in Q&A. But uh, appreciate folks joining. Let me stop the sharing here. And let me see chat. What did I make all the mistakes on? Oh, the general is now in a museum about two miles from where I'm sitting. Yeah, Carol and I went there a number of years ago, and I uh, uh, I was just thrilled to see the general. Uh, I'm a train nut. Carol knows anytime we go anywhere, there's a train, I, I will go and look at it. And I'm a real big on fan. The, on the way to Savannah, wasn't it? That's the, right. That we yeah. stopped there? We stopped there, right. And uh, I, I've got a bunch of pictures of the general. I mean, I had seen it at the 64 World's Fair. and never thought I'd see it again, but... Uh, yeah, that's a, a great exhibit. And I mean, it looks brand new. It looks like it just came out of the factory. Uh, were the BIE on board with the 34 reopening? You know, I don't really have a lot on that. I, I think at that point in time, nobody from, uh, there's nothing the BIE could do about it at that point. You know, Chicago had it. They were going to run it. They didn't need the BIE blessing. Uh, you know, the, the, if you notice that there were no extra countries added during the 34 seasons, uh, there were all sorts of companies that built, you know, different exhibits to be company of uh, the, like the, uh, say the uh, Ireland Pavilion was built by a company, it wasn't built by the nation. So uh, I don't know if the BIE ever took a position on, I'll have to go and look at their website to see if they mention it as being the 33 or the 33, 34 fair. Uh, the Ford Pavilion looks almost identical to the one in uh, San Diego. Yeah, uh, if it works, uh, you know, don't don't uh, don't mess with it. Now they ended up taking that pavilion back to Ford headquarters, and it was there for years and years. Uh, and then, unfortunately, they need the roof fixed. And I don't know how many buildings burned down because people were working on the roof. They got a pot of hot tar, they're heating with a torch, and you burn the building down. So the Wonder Rotunda had been there for years and uh, had burned down. Where is the site if I look on Google Earth? If you uh, do a search and look for Soldier's Field and see if Google Earth can find you Soldier's Field. Soldier's Field was already pre-existing next to the site. It's still there today. And it's basically where the giant convention center is out on the, uh, the lake shore. Let me scroll, Art Deco. Yeah, I, I love the Art Deco design. Oh, okay. And the main sculpture is enjoy. That was the, um, the met, was that the metal ones you were talking about? Susan? Yeah, if you're muted, if you hit the space bar, it will unmute yourself. Oh, Joey, this sub was not attacked by a giant squid. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now I'm unmuted. Yeah, yeah. I'm from Joliet, Illinois, and that's Joliet Central High School's mascot, and they call him the Steelman. Oh, that's right. Okay, yeah. yeah. yeah I, I ought to read my own book. It's mentioned in there. Yeah. I don't know what happened to the other two sculptures. That doesn't seem to be with it, though. They're probably the in... Blanket. Yeah, they're probably in storage someplace. Yeah. But yeah, no, I got a real kick at it. So the more I did studies of, of the uh, 33, 34 fair, again, you know, I went back and read an awful lot of old newspaper articles about it, and the politicians were just fighting this thing tooth and nail, just didn't want it. 
And then when those bonds sold and all of a sudden they said, hey, you know, we got all these people that want to come to this thing. Amazing how the, uh, the mayor and everybody had a total 180 degree turn within about a three month window. But this fair is going to bankrupt Chicago. It's the worst possible thing we could do to, man, you got to come to Chicago. You got to come. We're, oh, wow. What a fair we're going to have. So it was, uh, it was really interesting. And then, like I mentioned, uh, and I think I have in the book, or I don't remember if I put the pictures in there. When the fair ended, uh, you know, they, they thought 33 was going to be the end of it. A lot of people just went insane, just started tearing out all sorts of things. And the, the police had huge problems with riots, people throwing people through plate glass windows, stealing chairs. And I mean, the, the last night of the 33 season was truly horrible. 34, they got off a little bit better because there was talk about bringing it back to 35. So, uh, you know, I guess people were a little less uh, desirable to, you know, smash something that might be there in 35. But at the end of the 33 season, people, uh, they, they went kind of way out to, uh, to, to take pieces of it home. It looked hmm. like it was so big that it would take several days to really see everything. Yeah, it was, it was a big I mean, If you go into each of those villages, and going to each yeah. of the shops. And, and again, almost every one of those villages had performers. You know, we saw the dancers and the skaters and everything, you know, an hour for this show, an hour for that show, an hour for this show, pretty much uh, you're done for the day, come back another day. Anybody from the Chicago area? I am. Oh, do you go out the, the fair side at all? No, well, every time I've gone by it, I always try and look to see if I can recognize anything that still exists. And years ago, there's some of the walkways that would have gone across the train tracks were still there, but they've since torn those down, unfortunately. They probably weren't stable anymore, but there's really, there's not anything left, which is really sad. Yeah, I mean, uh, like I said, there's one marker for the uh, Italian aviators that came over that's sitting there in Elbow. the middle of the park. Yeah, yeah. And other than that, there's not a lot. I mean, you can still because the planetarium's there you can still orient yourself okay here's where the uh uh what you call it the, the main entrance was and uh you know again you got the lagoon and the land masses are there but the buildings are all pretty much gone and it's 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 right. hard hard to figure out where it all was i still don't blame i i still don't like that you guys tore out the airport i always wanted to land a real plane yeah. there after landing it so many times on flight simulator <laughs> As, uh, this is Werner. I live in the Chicago area. I've been here since 84. And uh, I still haven't made it out to Northerly Island, which is what the old uh, fairgrounds were called that was Makes Field for 50 years. And it's been a park since, I want to say, what, 96? I think I'd prefer to, be, to being a park. So uh, that's for quite a long time. I still haven't made it out there. Shame on me. I live in LA and I've been there. What's wrong with you? Yeah, I mean, I've been to the Field Museum many, many times. So you look at the maps of the of the fair, and it'll show the Field Museum and the Adler Planetarium, and the sh I mean the uh, the Adler Planetarium, the Shed Aquarium, and they're all still there. the The grounds around there are beautiful. They they took Lakeshore Drive, which used to kind of cut right through it. One lane went on one side of the Field Museum, the other lane went on the other side of the Field Museum. They moved it all to one side, turned everything in between to parkland. Seemed like a big waste of money when they announced it, but seeing the results, they did a masterful job. It's just such such a nice lakefront park now. It is. Carol and I were there. Uh, we've been there a couple times, and uh, you know, our son had been thinking about going to school, and uh, we went out there. And he, when he found out what winter was like, he said no. But we had gone out there for that. We went there. I, I gave a talk when my book came out. We've been out there to you know be able to compare the progress over the years as the. Uh, uh, you know the, the site has been redeveloped and it uh it is a great great park and you know again that that's why again the didn't become the 35 fair they they wanted to make it a park you know which was why they were filling in all that dirt in the first place so it, it all worked out well but you got to get out to northerly island it's it's there it's easy but they made it an airport for 50 years that still is, is surprising to me yeah, makes feel like I said for fi flight simulator. That was when you turned it on. That was the airport, you, the, the default airport to start at. So I mean, millions and millions and millions of us learned how to fly out of Mix Field. And then, you know, the mayor decided he didn't want that anymore. So he just came out in the middle of the night with some uh, bulldozers, carved giant holes in the runway, and said, "Sue me." So, <laughs> you know, it, uh, it was uh, unfortunate that that was done, but uh, I guess it worked out now. I still would want to. You know, 
just for old time's sake, I wanted to land there. Or fortunate <laughs> if you think of what a great lakefront Chicago has. I know, but I'm selfish. I wanted to land there. <laughs> I went and got my pilot's license. I bought an airplane. They did everything I needed to do, and Chicago took away the airport. Oh. <laughs> you were talking about light and the importance of light and, you know, with Westinghouse and everything. Um, I don't, you probably are aware there was an art exhibition that Westinghouse sponsored. And the reason that they had artists do the paintings, I'm an art dealer in Chicago, um, was because of the lack of color film that was accurate. So they had artists paint the fair as it was. Oh, and every cool. once in a while, I see these paintings come through and they're mind blowing really. And they're all about light, all of them. Yeah, I, I've seen a number of the paintings, on, uh, just reproductions. I haven't seen them in person, but that's where, you know, to me, I look at things like the Avenue of Flags and in black and white is, eh, it's okay. It's impressive. It's big. And you see the colors and like the Mayan temple buildings. Uh, again, I've only seen, you know, what people's versions of it were, but, you know, you see all the golds and the reds and everything on it. it, it uh, I, w I would truly have loved to have seen more of this fair and actual color as opposed to, uh, you know, just people's versions of color. Somebody said, how do you think we air traffic controllers feel about MiGs being demolished? Probably relieved as hell. <laughs> I imagine that was probably one heck of a uh, thing, getting the uh, the traffic in and out of that part because every amateur would have gone there. So uh, are you an air traffic controller in the area, Bob? Uh, I worked in New York and I retired a year ago. But uh, yeah, it was all the way. When that happened, I think every air traffic controller in the country, many of whom were pilots, uh, it was all the rage of discussion for actually a couple of years. Oh, I, it, then there was all the talk about you know putting it back and doing all the rest of it. So, uh, you know, air traffic controller, my hats off to you. I've dri driven a few of you guys crazy on my own adventures. <laughs> <laughs> it's not talking about all the miscellaneous stuff. Uh, my background today is a picture from one of Bill's CDs of an unknown fountain. And it's really kitschy looking. It's got some uh, whimsical mushrooms on top and fake tropical birds around the bottom. And the center looks like it may be in an aquarium. Uh, you can triangulate from the picture where it was, but there seems to be no documentation of what that uh, pavilion was that looks like a tropical hut mixed. Yeah, they, I had to mute myself there because the, the mail lady is delivering today's latest haul from eBay and the dogs, the dogs love the mail lady. They, they really do. And our biggest problem is you open the door we have our daughter's dog here and she shoots out and she tries to get in the mail lady's truck. And, you know, she, they get so excited about it. So I apologize for the noise, but you know, as a male person, she's, she's very happy to have dogs that love her for a change. But yeah, as Wayne was mentioning, they, they filled the grounds with all sorts of interesting things. There were all those gardens mentioned and uh, you know, the different companies would come out and try to outdo it. And this is a great way for the uh, fair corporation to fill space in between pavilions to have somebody else and come and pay you to put displays out there. And things like the fountain he's mentioned, there's all sorts of little art pieces and whimsical sort of things scattered around the, uh, the fairgrounds. And what the challenge for me was a lot of these things don't appear in the guidebooks. So you see this neat fountain and then you have to start going into old newspapers and you try to say, okay, do a search on World's Fair Chicago mushrooms and see if you can find out anything about who the artist was that uh, created it because it was nobody that uh, you know was going out and, and doing the definitive work today. Of course, everything on the internet's you know reviewed, parsed, documented everything. I mean, at Disneyland, somebody could tell you exactly how many water fountains there are, you know, and down to how many gallons of water they pump per minute or something. Back then, everything was just there. It was torn down. You move on. So some of this stuff is available in records uh, in uh, different museums that the, the World's Fair Corporation donated as paperwork to. But then you have to say it's not indexed, it's not online. And if I go to Chicago, do I want to spend a week looking up who did the mushrooms or do I want to get online and try to get a pizza? So Carol and I, <laughs> every time we go to Chicago, the pizza restaurants, everybody tells us to go to, oh yeah, we have a four and a half hour wait. 
So someday yeah, that, we're going to get good food. That Chinese place was great. Oh, yeah. Remember that? I, yeah. I wish we had that here. Yeah, we were at the school and we were uh, uh, one of the two schools that Neil was at. And uh, I guess it was no Northwestern. Is that it? And uh, yeah. somebody he's asked about a Chinese restaurant, and they sent us to one. It was huge. So the next time we went back to uh, Chicago, had to go there again, and then uh, we found a smaller branch of it someplace else. So uh, we tend what to restaurant to was it? I'm trying to remember the name of it. I, I have pictures of it that I took when we went to one of their other ones, but um, it was the biggest Chinese restaurant I've ever seen in my life, and the portions were just absolutely insane. And you know, we uh, we just had a wonderful time at it. But so. Uh, uh been there a couple times before we go back to chicago each time i look it up and make sure we go but it was, it was I'll, if i look it i'll try to remember to post it on online it was uh it was really just a great spot we like chicago except we don't like your winters so <laughs> me neither i don't like it either <laughs> it wasn't even winter when we were there it was spring break yeah and it was still so cold coming off the lake it was amazing to us because we're used to this warm climate <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we got out there and it, it was it was chilly and the wind was coming and then people were talking about, oh, yeah, it's been the first winter or the first weekend you could actually climb out on the rocks that are out on the uh, lake because last week they were still covered in ice. And Neil was <laughs> like, no. So uh, he liked the, the tour and then we went and visited the university and then, uh, you know, we left. He did not go back. So <laughs> I just want to add, though, there is no such thing as bad weather, only inappropriate clothing. That's true, I guess. Oh, I don't know. I, I, I was there. I, I worked in Chicago on and off for a, a company, and I was there. There was bad weather. I mean, I can remember people, we had a no-smoking building, and it would be about five degrees out. The wind would be howling, and I would say, man, people really got to be addicted because they'd be out there smoking like crazy, and it'd be five degrees out. And then I was there for one time. It was right around one of the conventions, and it, I knew why it was called the Windy City. I mean, I went down to the Navy Pier, and I thought I was going to be blown right back to the other side of the city. It was incredibly windy. So it, uh, it was a fun city. I, I've been there a bunch of times. Uh, Disney sent me back. It was a museum broadcast communications. And the uh, Disney sponsored the reopening of it. So they sent me, Fess Parker, and Dave Smith from the archives to Chicago for a weekend. So we got uh, you know, lunch with the mayor, treated like VIPs, and thought it was real nice. And then, uh, you know, Went back the next time, it was the middle of summer, it wasn't so nice. You guys have humidity. Way too much. Well, I'm Bill? open. Yes. <laughs> Bill? Oh, I like Joey's in gorilla mode. Yeah. I got to go, but I just wanted to thank you for uh, a great show. Well, thanks for joining, Joey. Appreciate it. And, uh, I enjoyed seeing those uh, those two photos uh, representing my my brethren. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I'm sure if they bring back another fair, we'll get you a gorilla job. <laughs> Thanks, Bill. Take care. Wanted to ask if people had particular uh, suggestions or requests uh, for a chat for the next week. Uh, run through a bunch of fairs. I've been talking about doing a return to Disneyland or Disney World for some vintage looks at that. We could also look at uh, the Knoxville World's Fair, uh, the Scuba World's Fair, a variety of different ones. Do I have more pictures of the amusement uh, rides and Midway to share? Uh, uh, pictures of the roller coaster. I don't have the Bozo ride. I do have some pictures of the roller coaster. You know, what happened was I have so many pictures. I, I have thousands of pictures that I ended up buying and I ended up restoring the ones I needed for the book. And then I realized I have several thousand that I did not get around to fully doing. So I'm gonna have to take a look. Oh, Freedom Land. Yeah, that might be a, a good one to do. That's the theme park in uh, the Bronx that uh, uh, I'll have to see. You know, again, the trouble is I have, if it, people don't mind looking at unrestored pictures that still have dirt and scratches on it, we could do Freedom Land tomorrow. Uh, I tend to you know do one here and then it takes so much time to do it. I come back to it a month later or a year later or whatever, but yeah, I'll put freedom land on, on the list. Um, how many people would like to see pictures of early Disneyland for next week? That's the one you've got some great pictures on Facebook of early Disneyland. And it'd be neat to see, you know, those in order or whatever. You've got some good pictures. Yeah. Again, I, I try to go with the things that were the amateur shots that, you know, one, 
somebody went to Disneyland and, uh, you know, everybody takes pictures of the exact same things. You know, it's one of the things I realized over time. If you put a Kodak picture spot sign someplace, everybody will take a picture, like, religiously. So at the 64 World's Fair, everybody is the exact same picture of the exact same dinosaur and because it was a Kodak picture spot. And you can actually kind of tell with Disneyland when they moved things around, when it went from the Kodak picture spot to the GAF photos, whatever, they kind of moved things around. And over the years, everybody took this picture. Now everybody takes that picture. But I also like to try to get some of the, uh, the other, you know, kind of off the wall pictures of things that people took. So, yeah. These uh, what, pictures were spectacular. The 1933, these pictures were amazing. Yeah, when you consider the film at the time used so much light, uh, you know, for people to be able to get it, that's why there's not a lot of interior shots. The shot that I had of General Motors interior was a publicity shot. Uh, and I think that was the only one I used on today that was a, a publicity photo. Because for the average amateur to come in, you have to be setting up lights all down it, all slaved <laughs> to a master thing, tripods, all the rest of it, you, you tended not to get them. So um, there were some days like the interior of the building when it was totally empty in the preview, somebody could come in, there was nobody moving because otherwise you take a picture of everybody's moving around and you get the, end up with all the blurs. So that one's an amateur was able to get a, uh, one of that. But yeah, that's why I have for 33, very few uh, interior shots. But uh, I, I've got so many pictures from the, I, I, I do one of these talks and the next thing I know, I want to go and restore the other 5,000 I haven't done yet. So, <laughs> and I got to stop by and I'm like, I, we let all our mail coming in these days sit in quarantine for a while because of the, the coronavirus thing. And I can look into the hallway and Carol the other day said, oh, I'm glad we got this table. I think there's a table under it. I just keep buying way too much stuff. So, okay, next week I'll, I'll do Disneyland. I would love Disneyland. I know we have some of our federal Imagineering alumni and Disney uh, uh, folks on it. So, yeah, we, we can do that. And uh, we can take a look at some of the things that came to be and uh, did not last all that long. I, I, you know, it's funny. Uh, we do a talk about Disney and postmodern architecture. And you look at some of the displays that were in uh, Tomorrowland at the time, like the bathroom of the future, some of those things. Uh, so we'll see. Oh, let's see. Early Disney, oh, uh, Knott's, Movie Land, Wax Museum, yeah, Glen Barker, Bush Gardens. We went to Bush Gardens the last week that it uh, it operated, and uh, a bunch of us knew that it was, uh, for people that don't know it, Bush Gardens out here in Van Nuys was a theme park, and it had uh, two different parts. One was uh, you took the tram ride through the uh, brewery, you came out, you got free beer, and then they had uh, gardens all over the place. Uh, bird shows in it. and then they built this theme park where they had a log flume ride and other odds and ends and then they announced it was going to end that uh, they couldn't keep up with Disneyland and they needed the capacity because they need, now needed to start brewing more light beer so we went to it the uh, the last about the last weekend it was open if not the last night and uh, people were going to the gift shop to buy stuff and people as you know like oh god damn I'm out of my job tomorrow the damn Disney what do you do for a living oh no, I, I just do computer stuff. I, you know, I, didn't, I did not tell anybody I worked for Disney, but it was a great spot to go to. And I drive by it all the time. There's only one replica, uh, one remnant of Bush Gardens left, which they had a train track that went right through the middle of it. Sound familiar for several World's Fairs? And they built a bridge that went up across and back down so you could get to the other side of the theme park that they added. And when they tore it down, they left the bridge there for whatever reason. So if you drive down and go through Van Nuys is this bridge sticking up in the middle of the air with no way to get to it on the left, no way to get to it on the right. And there's no indication it was once a theme park. It's just tractor trailers coming and going mm -hmm. with this giant bridge sitting in the middle of it for no apparent reason. Big fan of Space My high Mountain. school boyfriend loved Bush Gardens. We were underage and they would just let you pick up a beer <laughs> and walk around with it and never ID'd you, they never did anything. Yeah, I, I liked it for people coming from out of town. It was real convenient. I lived in Burbank at the time and it was a you know, 15, 20 minute ride. Uh, the uh, uh, beer ride was great fun. The theme park was pretty economically priced as I recall where the, the log rides and stuff were. Uh, so yeah, I do have a picture that I don't, you know, 
I was just thinking, I have pictures of the deer park. I probably don't have enough to say do an hour in the deer park, an hour in Bush Gardens. But what I could do is do an uh, hour of, hey, things from Southern California, like Wax Museum, Deer Park, Bush Gardens that are, are gone. I could certainly do Universal Studios. I worked there for a couple of years, got a bunch of pictures of that. So that's, I, I appreciate the ideas. Did I do what? Knott's Berry Farm? Uh, I could do Knott's Berry Farm. Yeah. I'd love that. That'd be great. Yeah. Have you ever researched Bilbao Park, the two World's Fairs that took place there? No, I've been there and I've looked around, but I've not done a lot of uh, research on it. You know, and, and again, on one of these things, if if any of you does have a topic like Don, if you were an expert on Balboa Park, uh, I am absolutely open to the idea of uh, you know guest stars. Uh, now we turn it over to to Mr. Balboa Park for the day. Uh, you call me an expert. I've been there twice, so it's fascinating. Almost all the pavilions are still there. So, well, if anybody has like an old theme park, a amusement park, or something from their town, you know, almost every town had you know, their version of Palisades Amusement Park or, you know, uh, you know, whatever. Uh, I, could, I could also do Palisades one day in Rockaway's Playland. So, uh, yeah, if there's things that people would like to do for uh, their uh, own particular interest, you know, that are World's Fair theme park type, uh, uh, you know, uh, interest, please let me know. And, uh, you know, Albert Fisher and I, for example, we did the Seattle World's Fair together. Uh, you know, I, I am totally open to people that are up on stuff and know more than I do to sit back and, you know, listen to somebody else pontificate for a while as well. And, and we'll repeat hemispheres <laughs> for the list. I'm still a big fan of that there. Yeah. Uh, Dave, yeah, Bill, yeah Bill, wrote, I, think they, I think a combined show would be fantastic on, have you ever seen the show that Ralph Story did years ago called Things That Aren't Here Anymore? Yes, yes, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That, <clears throat> something like that you could do combined, you know, like a Calico ghost town and how that became Knott's Berry Farm and movie land. I mean, we used to just love to go to all these places. Yeah, I'll, I'll, uh, that's a great idea. I can do that a compendium of uh, places. It, Dave English is mentioning rode the Matterhorn in the middle of the night when they were getting ready to build Space Mountain in Florida to see what it was like. It's a hell of an experience when you see how close you come to those steel beams, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. The, the very first time I rode space, I had ridden Space Mountain in Florida, you know, and then I got hired in Florida, moved out here, and I got put on the job of working in Space Mountain out here. And I was like, wow, real excited, you know, uh, running sandbags through it and everything, and now we're going to ride the real thing. And there were about four or five of us that decided, let's go ride it. So I uh, hit the dispatch button, jumped in the thing, got to the first t turn, and it, it, the ride shut down. And we realized that this wasn't the smartest thing we could have ever done because all of us that know how to turn or do anything about it are all sitting up here on this sled and the other guy went out to lunch and the guy that was we were on the bank turn and the guy that was on the other side the higher side of me weighed about twice what i weighed and i just spent the entire time pushing him back you know and, and you know oh god how long are we going to be up here and there was for the folks that worked on it would know there was a whole system about you couldn't go into the mountain if it was running she didn't want to get hit and a, a key sign out thing and key id tags and everything and finally this guy door opens the guy says, is there anybody in the mountain and was, get us down from here <laughs> so yeah my first ride on space mountain was one for the ages it was like you know all the things to do in ride testing 101 not to do dave you had the same ex experience uh, let's see. Can, you can hear me, right? Yeah. So, but, but my experience was working at, um, it was wet at the time. Uh, actually, I guess it was Imagineering at the time. But this was a precursor to even building a ride in Florida, where it's like, I wonder how people will respond, not me, but the company was like, wonder how people will respond to riding a roller coaster in the dark. And so we went down to, from Glendale, we went down to Disneyland and they turned off all the, the lights around the Matterhorn and we rode the Matterhorn, we got on it and over and over and over, we went up and down and up and down. And believe me, after, I, I don't go on those rides. So for me, cause I have sensitivity to, to motion, uh, high sensitivity. And so, you know, I'm stumbling out of the, the Matterhorn ride thing yeah, I guess everybody that loves this will just really like Space Mountain. And then they then went ahead and built the one in Florida. And then the Disneyland one was built after that. So uh, 
that was a, uh, my job was part of the show group to put in the surveillance system that could see in the dark. And so we had to, to spot infrared in those days, you had analog video cameras. And so we had an infrared source that people couldn't see sources that we would light up the areas where the, the cameras are going to be. So I was in those days clambering around on the structure with the lights on, but still it was precursor to the OSHA days where you had to have a, a safety belt and cabling. And uh, of course I was young and foolish and thankfully nothing bad happened, but it was an interesting experience, no doubt about it. One of the things I learned from uh, the Space Mountain experience was I, I, I was tasked to go into the in-between, the cafeteria, and say, hey, anybody like to go ride Space Mountain? And, uh, you know, we would take people in, and I mentioned earlier, we'd run through it a whole bunch of times uh, to try to get weight balance calculations. But realized that we would have buckets along this, the uh, unload area because people would get off and start vomiting after having been on it 10, 12 times. And I realized after a while, if you bring people in to ride it and they'd say, what are all these buckets for? That they would get nervous. So we would make sure we put everybody on it, dispatch and then we would open the closet and take out the buckets and line them against the wall. So it's just the things you realize from, you know, it's otherwise the buckets are always there. We have to clean them out. Uh, no, people came in, they saw those buckets. They did not want to get on that ride. Uh, Bill, yeah, I, I I worked on uh, the Walt Disney World Florida project, uh, Space Mountain. Uh, I worked anyway. We went down uh, for some testing when they were doing, you know, first when it was, they finally had the ride running, but not, you know, show wasn't done or anything like that. And so you rode through the building under work lights, so you could see everything. And you had mentioned earlier about steel beams, how close you came. Well, there was this one place in design there, and it was a tandem car for the first time. I liked the Matterhorn. It had been single cars. And you uh, would, they would put everybody who had never ridden it before in the back car so that as you went through and you got to this one spot where the track did a quick drop off, but as you're going along, the people in the front car who had already ridden it before would duck their heads down and all you saw was this steel beam coming straight at you or you were coming straight at that you didn't realize you were gonna drop away from. It was gonna behead you. And when everybody ducked down, it was like they knew that they had to duck down and you didn't. And then suddenly you dropped away and it was always a fun game. That's what they played or all the newbies that came to ride the ride for the first time. <laughs> so that was kind of interesting because that was probably one of the most close places to hit yourself but you really weren't that close it just looked like you were because of especially if you're in the back car where you couldn't see that the track was going to drop away do you remember when the idiot cast member decided to stand up and uh try to get out of the car mid mid ride yes yeah for yeah, those that was... don't know it he thought it'd be really funny because if you sent a rocket out and you didn't have a full load in it you were supposed to tell the people at the other end you know don't worry that there's you know nobody fell out well, he decided he would jump out and, you know, uh, let his friends all worry what happened to him. Well, he tried to get out and took a steel beam across the face. And he was lying back in the tunnel, you know, moaning. And everybody's, hey, George, come on, get out of there. And then when they saw the blood, realized it wasn't quite as funny. So uh, yeah. Yeah, that, was, that was not a smart move on his behalf. Glenn. Yeah, on a lighter note, on one of the versions of the onboard audio we were installing one night, and we decided because they had all the video projectors installed, you know, and projecting things all over inside the, the top. So we had a pizza party up there and watched the movie Mars Attacks. <laughs> the <end> of the <laughs> <night>. <laughs> so you, what, crazy fun. Did they have, uh, they didn't have sound on the first set of rockets, did they? No, the, uh, the sound went in much later. I forget what year it was. How much weight did that add to the rockets? More than the ride people wanted. Yeah, I would imagine it would be yeah, quite a challenge. To take uh, our speakers off of things. But uh, I think it, you know, the biggest uh, challenge there was getting power. So they had to install these conductors and put big uh, capacitors on board. So when the thing comes through the load station, it stops four times. And that's all the opportunity they have to recharge so that the sound will 
you know, be able to play. Well, maybe one day one of you guys that designed this stuff can explain to me the giant chocolate chip cookie theory. <laughs> it looks like it there. <laughs> it does. I mean, the first time I wrote it, I, my first thought, I love chocolate chip cookies. My first thought was, oh, God, they use cookies for this or whatever. So it's become an in-joke about people jo joking about the giant chocolate chip cookie. But yeah, recognize anybody? A lot of these uh, souvenir slides, they would get employees to go and pose in them because, uh, you know, the, yeah, you have to stop it, put the people in the reentry tunnel, put the, uh, you know, cameras and everything so you couldn't run it through it. But, and everybody, if you look at them, they all have nice Disney style haircuts, don't they? <laughs> so, yeah, we could uh, take, so, yeah, tr trying to whet your appetite for vintage Disneyland. Well, great. I created Appreciate all of the original soundtracks for the first version of Disneyland. Oh, do you? You still have them? Uh, pro I don't know if I have them. They're in the library at work. I, when I uh, retired, I didn't bring a whole lot of that home. I'd had enough of it. But one of the funniest stories there is Exitensio and I were working on ideas. And there's one area that's like a meteor tunnel where you go through. And so I just went in the studio and I took the microphone and I went choo, 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 and edited that and sped him up and slowed him down and just as a test and I played it for X and he says great we're done so that played in there until we put the onboard audio in <laughs> so you could hear me <laughs> the scratch track huh yeah yeah I'm just looking here I can find all sorts of fun pictures for next week uh anybody remember this version Mickey and Minnie Oh God! <laughs> <laughs> oh, th th it's these are this, these are the Mark Twos. The Mark Ones are even worse. They were costumes that they got from the uh, uh, Ice Capade show, and they were truly, truly horrifying. So uh, th this was the first set of Disney design characters, as opposed to the uh, uh, you know Ice Capade characters. And yeah, they're they're a little bit different. So I mean, uh, you look at the, uh, the Mad Hatter here. I mean, oh, jeez. <laughs> <laughs> The he's pigs. A, he's yeah. scary looking. So, yep. Oh, the chipmunks again. You know, the, the Mark II chipmunks. I mean, it's that they're just, oh, that, that's pigs. not a man in the costume, Dad. That, those are real chipmunks. So, great. I'll do Disneyland next week and then we'll figure out what we do the week after that. So, appreciate everybody joining. And I hope nobody's going to melt down today. As, as I mentioned, it's supposed to be 103 here. And uh, I hope uh, the storm treat you guys on the east coast well and uh we will look forward to seeing you all again next week all right great thank you all right thanks take care. bill all right take care bye-bye